Let's go. My name is Alessandro Zanati, and I'm a, a collaborator here with Micromobility Industries. And uh, welcome to Micromobility World. Um, we're really starting off with a bang here. We've got two of perhaps the most influential figures in, in kind of the development arc of the micromobility industries. First is uh, Travis Van Der Zanden, founder and CEO of Bird, and uh, our very own Horace Deju, um, co-founder of Micromobility Industries. And uh, in this conversation, um, they're going to exchange a lot of their insights and, and explore kind of the global trajectory of the lightweight electric vehicle industry from kind of its early days in 2018 to the pandemic and kind of what lies in its wake. Um, really, Bird has catalyzed a step change in how people consider e-scooters and other modalities as part of their daily commute. And, and we're super excited to have Travis here because um, it'll mark the first public appearance um, that Bird has made since it went public in November. So I can't wait to hear these two um, who've, who've kind of gotten their hands dirty in the industry. And, and uh, we, we really look forward to, to this conversation. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Horace. And thanks again both for being here. Thanks, Alessandro, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's, it's my privilege and honor to kick off this uh, event and the um, opportunity to have this conversation, uh, uh, which is with, with probably the most um, famous leader of the industry uh, and certainly the first to uh, deploy what we now know of as the shared scooter model and therefore pioneer. But what people may not know is that Travis and I um, actually started off our careers in more or less the same industry. Uh, he started in uh, with Qualcomm while I was at Nokia, and Nokia and Qualcomm were rivals in those early 2000s. Uh, nonetheless, they were also cooperating, uh, and certainly uh, the technology uh, has evolved well beyond those early years. But what's interesting, because of our shared background in telecommunications, is that we both speak the same language as far as, you know, the potential for micromobility being very much related to the potential of the smartphone as we saw it back 20 years ago. Um, so firstly, let me ask you uh, if you think maybe that, you know, that this is an assumption that that's correct. Um, how do you think about the smartphone on wheels uh, as as we move into the next generation of of micromobility. Yeah, first let me start off by just saying thank you to you know you Horace and the entire micromobility you know conference team for having me here today. I've certainly been following the the conference closely and uh, appreciate your efforts. You know, really advancing the the industry and originally coining the the term micromobility. So again, thanks uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So yeah, no, it's super interesting. I think I, when I was at Qualcomm, as you mentioned, I think you were at Nokia around the exact same time. And you know, I, I first became fascinated about the cell phone industry in college when I got my my first cell phone, and ultimately uh, moved to California when I graduated in 2002. And I joined Qualcomm at at that time. My first job was actually a temp job. Uh, I was just trying to get my foot in the door into the cell phone world. Um, you know, I, I worked on the Brew App Store where we made mobile apps for cell phones. Back then, it was mainly ringtones, wallpaper, and kind of some simple simple gaming apps. Um, but that was five years before the iPhone was first launched. And so, you know, it really was very early on in the in the industry, but it had a sense for cell phones were just kind of in the going to hit an in inflection point. And I think, you know, the reason that I always was fascinated with the cell phone industry, and I, I think you were as well, or it's, is it's a you know it was it was a smaller form factor. It was more affordable. Um, it was a lot more fun to use. You could put it in your pocket and carry it around with you. Um, and so you know the interesting thing now, fast forwarding to today, or really back in 2017. I mean, one of the aha moments for me starting Bird was you know kind of those experiences in the cell phone industry, and uh, I saw a lot of similarities with micromobility and a lot of parallels. Um, and there might have been some pattern pattern recognition there, but you know, it is um, with, with micromobility, it's obviously a smaller form factor. It's more affordable. It's easier. It's more fun to use than a than, than a car, um, in particular, a gas car. And and so, you know, the parallels are, are pretty in, incredible. Um, you know, the micromobility industry, you know, seems to be following a similar path as kind of the cell phone industry. And, you know, back in in in, I guess, you know, in the years leading up to the iPhone, 
I would say when, you know, the electric scooter, which we first launched in 2017, probably wasn't even the iPhone moment for the industry. I mean, it seems like we're still waiting for, you know, that iPhone moment. I, I usually say the, the electric scooter is maybe like the Motorola Rose, uh, Razor uh, of, of the of the industry, which is a, you know, people really like the Razor a lot, but then the iPhone came along and it, it really did accelerate things even further. Uh, and it's, you know, super excited to see what this industry is going to create over the next decade. Absolutely. And I, I feel the same way. I think the iPhone moment is yet to come um, and it's it's going to be very much a software enabled product and service. Um, just one uh, thing I noted today, actually, I, I posted this data uh, uh, that someone, uh, I think it was App Annie, an analyst a house that is looking at uh, and mobile apps. As you mentioned, you started with mobile apps. Well, today it turns out like 4.8 hours a day are spent by people on their mobile phones uh, using apps. 4.8 hours, and if you go back 20 years and ask yourself, well, we only had 16 hours then, we only have 16 hours waking hours today. You know, it's hard to imagine how people could end up taking so many hours to do something that they never did before. And, and that's one of the things that really motivates me when it looks, when you when we look at transportation, because we don't see time the same way, right? As far as like, you know, time in transportation and time time interacting with things. Um, and, and, you know, you pick it up in niches. That's how the phones went along. And, um, and that aggregates quickly. So every little, you know, 10 seconds here, 10 seconds there. So one of the things I want to think about and I want to get your thoughts on is, you know, to what extent, yeah, we're competing with cars and trying to get people to transition out. But to what extent are we actually enabling people to do things that they wouldn't have done before? Do you see any kind of data, like in terms of people taking rides on your vehicles, which are, would have been essentially no, you know, competing with non rides, you know, not taking that trip. Um, and, you know, how do we think about competing without consumption in micro mobility? Uh, is, is this something that you're seeing in your, in your, in your data? Yeah, I mean, it's, we definitely see anecdotally that, you know, people are using micro mobility to not just replace, you know, ride, ride sharing trips, gas car trips, uh, they're replacing, you know, some some public transit, although it's very complementary with with public public transit, uh, and then it's replacing, you know, in some some kind of walking trips as well, obviously. And, you know, I think it's it's hard to 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 really get great data on this, but I, I do think, you know, anecdotally from speaking with people, it seems like people are taking more trips as a result of the convenience of having micro mobility, whereas, you know, if, if it used to take you maybe a couple miles to get somewhere you really didn't want to wait or pay for a ride sharing app. And so, and it was a little bit too far to walk and therefore maybe you didn't take that trip historically, but micro mobility really has opened up, you know, the industry. And I think as a result, adding, you know, even more trips uh, globally, uh, as you, uh, I think have pointed out before, and we certainly see in our data, 50 to 60% of all trips in the city are five miles or less. And, mm -hmm. and we think that uh, micro mobility will continue to, to expand, but we're already going after, you know, the, the, the most amount of trips in a, in a city. And, and as you mentioned, you know, the, you know, the gas car is really the ultimate competition here. Absolutely. So um, now you also have a career or you had a, 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 a quite a lot of time spent with the ride hailing industry. And um, I just wonder, you know, when, when you appeared on the scene in 2017 with bird, uh, to what extent did you actually sort of also leverage, you leverage the phone business, obviously, and you'd leverage, uh, you know, the, the, the electric industry, if you will, the electric vehicle industry with, with lithium, lithium ion batteries. But to what extent did you also think about, you know, hey, instead of selling these vehicles, why don't we put them out there? Did, did, you, did you come through that learning experience via your experience with Right Hail? Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, I was definitely, you know, kind of influenced by my days at Qualcomm, as we talked about, but then my my time as an executive in, in ride sharing, you know, really helped open my eyes, you know, to this to this problem or opportunity. You know, in, in ride sharing, I really enjoyed my time in ride sharing, and I think we we're having a positive impact on things like maybe reducing parking problems, reducing some drinking and driving in, in cities. Um, but at the end of the day, I think ride sharing was making traffic and carbon emissions quite a bit worse in the cities. You know, the cars would would circle around waiting for their their next fare and, and you know, using a gas car to circle around waiting is it's just cr creating more traffic and carbon emissions. And I think some reports have it around maybe even as much as 2x as, as bad as 
just driving a gas car yourself. And so while there was some positive impact, you know, it, it didn't just didn't feel like the right, uh, you know, business approach or the right thing for the, the environment. Um, also, you know, vast majority of rideshare trips are incredibly short distance. You know, most of them are, are less than five miles. It's essentially short, less than five mile trips in ride sharing and then also airport uh, trips. And so, you know, for me, it really inspired me to, to start Bird in, in 2017 to go after those short range trips, try to move them to an environmentally friendly, you know, vehicle and um, felt like the electric scooter was 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 the right way to to do that. And, um, you know, so far, it seems like we've been able to have a, a, a pretty decent impact on some of these short range trips, but still a lot more work to be done. Absolutely. And I think the industry is, is realizing that, you know, there is this uh, inefficiency that comes along with, you know, having to share a vehicle that with a driver that costs a lot of money, but it also takes a lot of space and it consumes a lot of fuel to move around. So the payload, uh, the, the ratio between weight of vehicle and payload has always been the issue, whether it's shared or, or owned. And, uh, and in fact, in sharing it, it seems like there's a lot of overhead where, where we were not aware of before. Um, but let me ask one more question, historically speaking, which I've I'm, I'm always been fascinated because when, when I was looking at micromobility around the same time, 2017, we we're looking at bike share in China that was taking off. We we're looking at bike share in Europe as well. Um, E-bikes were taken off in private ownership and sometimes shared. But what, what puzzled me was like when you launched and in really like it was like uh, a catalyst. It's just it energized everything. But you launched in Santa Monica. Any insight as to why? Because it, it at the time it didn't make any sense because like that was a very car centric part of the world in general. And, you know, everybody was expecting Europe to go first or Asia. A, a lot of interest in kind of like the old cities, not the new cities. So what was the logic? Was it simply a coincidence that you did that? Um, yeah, maybe a little bit of coincidence. I mean, I, I moved from San Francisco where I was at, you know, for the ride sharing days down to Santa Monica to start Bird. Um, and so I was living there, but, you know, LA generally has some of the most traffic in the world, but it also has some of the best weather in the world. And so it felt like Burke could really have a big impact on, 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 you know, the entire, you know, LA area, as far as reducing traffic, reducing par parking problems, reducing carbon emissions. And so, you know, it was a little bit of coincidence, but also, you know, felt like it was a, it was a good market from a, you know, historically really bad traffic and, 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 you know, it tends to be an environmentally friendly uh, city, as far as citizens are, are are concerned, I mean, people tend to be more forward-looking uh, as as well, and so felt like for all those reasons um, that it um, you know was a was a great spot to you know to to start bird, and then you know I you know always get asked you know why an e-scooter not an e-bike, and and for me you know I I you know was testing all sorts of different electric vehicles that I would import. Um, and I tried, you know, the electric skateboard, the electric hoverboard, electric bikes, any electric vehicle you can imagine I, I was playing around with and testing out. But, you know, the electric scooter was uh, a vehicle that when I would when I would test it on, you know, family members and my wife and my mother and, and other family members, you know, people were able to ride it so easily. It, it would usually only take a minute or two to learn how to ride it. And uh, and everyone had a lot of fun riding as well. And it, it felt like a a very affordable vehicle that we could use to help move people around, you know, one to two miles in, in cities. And as you mentioned, you know, how ride sharing was incredibly inefficient because you have a 3000 pound gas car and a driver on board, you know, the, the e-scooter is the exact opposite. It's an incredibly efficient way to move someone around a city. And so, you know, I, I guess a, a little bit of coincidence there, but, you know, Santa Monica plus the e-scooter, you know, it seemed to, it seemed to take off very quickly for us. It, it was brilliant because I Again, it was a bit of a surprise to a lot of people who were looking at uh, small vehicles. Um, and, you know, you'd think, you'd, you know, you'd launch maybe in the place where, where people were more, more, there was more infrastructure. But there's a, the, the reason I, I appreciate that, though, is that, you know, the pioneers tend to actually do things a little bit asymmetrically. And, and it wasn't conventional wisdom, but it turned out to be the right decision because it got a lot of riders very quickly. It was the weather, as you mentioned. And also the use cases are interesting because they're um, the distances are, are are large enough that walking is not quite perfect solution once you park your car. And so you, you kind of have this ability to do three, four different things after parking, which was not the way, you know, maybe you know, malls, malls uh, or other places are designed. So it was it was an interesting decision. And I think a lot of people got excited because your numbers were so good early on and therefore it, it led to a lot of investment uh, following. 
which I think is is a brilliant strategy. The go-to-market is everything. Timing is everything, as everybody knows. Um, let's move on. I, I just want to talk about a little bit now the state of the world today. Uh, micromobility has gone a long way. Uh, we're looking at hundreds of millions of users. We're looking at hundreds of millions of rides. Cumulatively, um, we're also so, we saw the impact of COVID where um, there was both a contraction in some cases, but also an expansion in others where we saw effectively people's eyes being open to this opportunity, especially on the policy and governing the government, uh, government side. Um, but the other big thing that's happened is the increased awareness about the environment and the increased awareness about climate change. And, um, you know, initially and still to a large extent, I think, and I, I think we need to do a better job at this, but we people don't think micromobility first when they think about mitigating climate change. They think about electric car first. Um, and, you know, we saw this at COP26. Um, and uh, but as as we speak, more and more people are realizing that there's a there's this low hanging fruit. So, um, you know, how do we how should we help that acceleration? I, I I'm I'm struggling with this as a communicator, as an analyst. How, how can I help you to get that word out there? Uh, is there is there data? Is there anything we can do? Yeah, it's it's a great point and a and a great question. I mean, I think. I do appreciate all the efforts you and, and the micromobility industry are already doing, you know, and, and we'll certainly try to do our part and really the whole industry should continue to educate, you know, people on the environmental, uh, you know, how positive it is for the, you know, the environment to move people, you know, out of 3000 pound gas cars into not just an EV, but a micro EV that doesn't, uh, doesn't create traffic problems or use a less, lot less energy to get around. Um, you know, the, the average electric scooter, based on some of our, you know, data, prevents about 103 grams of greenhouse gas emissions over its lifetime. Uh, probably varies a little bit, you know, but about 103 grams. That's the equivalent of 40 trees for every electric scooter that's deployed in our cities. And, and so it, it actually is a, a pretty big impact. And, you know, if you look at, um, I, I think at one point we did the math and there's about 20,000 trees in, in Central Park in New York City. So that's the, you know, the equivalent of, of, of about 500 electric scooters is the same environmental impact of all of the trees in, in Central Park. You know, just to, we, we were kind of playing around with some interesting anecdotes to, to try to, you know, help people understand how, how positive this is for the environment. And, um, but, but it is a good question. You know, I, I don't really know the answer to that. I think um, it, it seems like cities in particular have, have latched on, but it's not clear that state and federal governments, at least in the U.S., have have yeah, really woke it's up definitely too. bottom up. I've noticed the same thing. It's 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 easier to convince people at a local level than it is at a state and a federal or and even international. That's when we saw COP26. It was like sort of the, that was the, the the top of the stack, if you will, in terms of decision makers. But but they're the laggards. They're not the people who really uh, uh, understand the the most relevant solutions. It's like again going back 20 years and asking what's going to be the future of my uh, of of uh, uh, telecommunications and you know you'd ask the CEOs of mobile network operators you know they would not have been the right ones or or regulators for that matter but um let's let's go to the city level then a little bit and say okay to covid people are suddenly looking at these as lifesavers they're looking at these vehicles as something that uh ke initially kept uh, first responders uh, able to to uh, actually uh, move um, because you know a lot of other opportunities for transport were were not were not available like transit and and they were not safe and um, and then and then they they established bike lanes they started to establish more and more parking spaces and so on for micro and um, and now it's seen by more and more city people as uh, not just a lifeline but something that's going to be permanent as the changes from uh, from COVID uh, began. So um, how how do we think about um, continuing that momentum and how do we go out there and um, uh, and and use that initial early adopter base of cities to sort of convince the 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 later stage and and sort of the main market? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right that COVID definitely created some tailwinds for the industry. I mean, I think most of 
that, you know, the vendors, you know, pulled the vehicles off the road when COVID first hit. But then as we put vehicles back out, it did seem like there was a lot of demand for people looking for naturally social distance, you know, rides and cities certainly took notice of that. And, and they really didn't want, uh, you know, people to mode shift out of public transit into gas cars. And so micromobility was able to, to help uh, with that as well. You know, your question about how do we keep the momentum? I mean, I think, um, you know, cities have, have really created a lot of bike lanes during during COVID. And I think that's been super helpful. You know, as the as the roads were were more idle, we saw a lot of bike lanes being deployed. I think one area I'd love to keep, you know, the momentum on even faster and, and try to help uh, help push for even more is just more more dedicated parking for micro mobility. I mean, we I think, you know, people will talk a lot about more bike lanes and I certainly think we need more more bike lanes and more micro EV lanes, but but in particular, I think we really need to work on more micro EV parking in cities. Um, it does seem like that's becoming more of the constraint than even bike lanes, but I think both are both are important. And I think as the industry, you know, c- cities historically, when I've talked to them, they mo- most of them all want more bike lanes and more bike infrastructure. They've just always been in this chicken and egg problem of, hey, if I if I try to create a close down one one lane for a for a you know, from a car and I take that away, I'm going to create more traffic problems. And if people aren't willing to get out of cars to get onto bikes or e-bikes or e-scooters, it puts the local politicians in a really tough spot and in a chicken and egg problem. We saw this in Venice, by the way, back in, I think it was 2016 um, in in LA, where they took a, a lane away from, from cars and there was a, you know, people were outraged. And uh, at the time, people weren't getting out of cars and using, you know, micromobility. And and I, I think, you know, we need to continue to solve this chicken and egg problem for cities by showing them that, hey, people are willing to get out of cars uh, now. Therefore, let's let's make sure the infrastructure follows suit. And that's bike lanes. But it's also more dedicated, uh, you know, parking for micromobility as well, which seems like uh, we need to continue to to push more for because I, I would say that's more of a constraint than even bike lanes at this point. Are you, are you seeing differences in terms of geographies and adoption? Because uh, you you know, you mentioned Venice, but is are there places in the world which you think are more thought leaders, more more early adopters in in transitioning uh, to to micro, or is, is there um, or is it still pretty much you know uh, random? Yeah, I mean, I certainly everybody on this call probably knows that Europe is 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 still way ahead of the U.S. I mean, I think the U.S. seems to have been closing the gap on on bike infrastructure more recently, but Europe is still it's still leading. I mean, I think, you know, Milan just uh, announced the big, you know, I think $200 million investment, something like this in, in you know, bike lanes throughout the city. And if you look at the design of, of, of that, it was actually, you know, pretty incredibly designed. I mean, it looked like almost like subway lines or something in a, in a city. And, I, you know, I was all excited when I, when I first read that, and, and it is exciting. But then when you read the, the fine print, it seemed like it wasn't gonna be rolled out till 2035. And so, so I think, you know, I, I think it's great that we're moving down this path, but but you know, trying to continue to accelerate it even even faster, I think would be would be great. And 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 you know, I think again, city planners have a tough time. They're in uh, you know chicken and egg problem. Plus, they have you know limited resources. So I think it's up us up to us as an industry to continue to show that people will get out of cars uh, to use you know micro EVs, and 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 then I think the hopefully the infrastructure will accelerate from there. Now you talked earlier that you're a pioneer with the with a scooter form factor, um, but you're not obviously committed only to one form factor. Um, you know, I like to think that yeah, there's the iPhone, there's the Razor, there's also the iPad. We ended up with mobile computing, even in terms of watches and wearables. So, uh, question: um, How do you see the form factor debate? Um, are you agnostic? Are you uh, experimenting? Um, um, you know, how do you, how do we? approach innovation as far as, uh, you know, this, this particular area of, of, uh, of, you know, literally just people just don't know what's the, what's the best way. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, we're definitely at bird, uh, you know, form factor agnostic. I mean, I think a lot of people thought we had religion on e-scooters early on, but for us, that was just, you know, a way to, you know, show that people will actually, you know, use the micro mobility and show massive distribution. But, you know, for us, really the competition is the gas car. And, and so we want to continue to to innovate on the form factor to try to get as many people out of gas cars as possible. Uh, you know, e-scooters are great for one to two mile trips. Um, you know, they tend to skew younger demographics. 
the e-bikes are great for kind of the two to five mile trips or maybe even a little bit longer. They tend to skew, you know, older, older demographics. I, I know I'm over 40 now, so it is good to, to sit down when you're, when you're going five miles and the e-bike certainly better for, for that. Um, but I think continuing to innovate as an industry, like I said, I don't think we've hit the iPhone moment yet. And, and, and so we're, we'll, we're, we'll certainly continue to uh, invest in R&D on our side to do our best to, to try to uh, continue to come up with different form factors to help get people out of gas cars. Uh, that's great to hear. And, um, you know, now there's one more thing. Um, you're the first, not just the first uh, scooter sharing company that's well known, um, but uh, you're also the first IPO uh, uh, in, in the space. And, um, you know, how, does that, how has that changed? I mean, that's asking more as a personal question as someone who's, you know, who's been uh, uh, an entrepreneur their whole life, uh, more or less. Um, it's like, how has your life changed being, uh, being in, in the, you know, uh, public uh, CEO? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting, but, but also, you know, a lot more, a lot more work as well, you know, in certain areas. Um, but, you know, for me, I ultimately, you know, liked the idea of taking Bird Public because, you know, it's a good branding event for the company. I think a good branding event for the entire industry. Absolutely. I think, you know, there's a lot of, I noticed there's a lot of misconceptions on the data in the industry as well. You know, there's a lot of press reports kind of pointing back to the 2017 data. And in the early days, the vehicles were just super fragile. They weren't built for the use case. They didn't last very long as we were really just trying to, I was literally buying them off of Alibaba.com in 2017. So we were just trying to prove that there was product market fit, but the, the vehicles have evolved a lot over the years, and we've certainly invested heavily in R&D to make sure the vehicles last longer and they're more ruggedized. And, and I think as part of going public, we were able to get some of that recent data out. And as people, you know, saw the, hopefully took note of the, how quickly the economics are evolving in this industry and how, I mean, in Q3, we had 50% ride profit before, before the vehicle depreciation, about 22% after. So, you know, the unit economics are positive in this industry. And, and I think other players are certainly showing that as well. And I think getting those financials out there and those economics out there hopefully help cities and, and investors and others realize that this industry is here to, here to stay and is growing quickly and the economics are already working today. Excellent. Um, you know, and, and we, talk about, we talked about evolution in the form factor, uh, but there's also potential evolution in the, in the business model. You, you know, we started with also with phones has evolved over the years. You know, as, as everybody knows, it's not just hardware today, it's services, it's subscriptions, it's content, it's media. Apple's now a media company, you know, making movies and making television shows. Um, so, so, you know, all the giants have, have not just become bigger, but there's also moved and pivoted and, and gone into adjacent spaces. Now, question, transportation is much more than utility. Transportation is much more than going A to B. You know, uh, it, over the years, the car guys moved into being, you know, lifestyle promoters and, uh, uh, you know, selling freedom or sex appeal or whatever it was. But uh, how do we think about business model evolution? How do we think about branding? How do we think about all these things that evolved be after you figure out how to do the basics, like getting people A to B? Are you willing to share anything with us on kind of like, you know, what you think are the most promising business models out there? Um, yeah, I mean, we're certainly constantly thinking about, you know, future things and, and, you know, but on the one hand, you know, we're excited about the future. On the other hand, we're still only a four-year-old company. And so, you know, staying, staying focused is also important. So trying to find that right balance is important. You know, for us, we think, you know, we tapped onto this massive, you know, sharing opportunity with first e-scooters and now now e-bikes, and that'll continue to be, you know, a major a major focus for us. But as you mentioned, you know, we have branched out into uh, consumer products and and selling you know e-bikes and e-scooters uh, for personal ownership because you know we it fits very squarely into our mission of trying to replace as many gas trips as possible, and and so some people want to rent and that's 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 great and we'll be there for them, but. A lot of people want to own their own vehicle as well, and so we want to we want to provide both those offerings. And I think we might be one of the only globally scale players doing that today, but I suspect others will. Um, and um, you know, they're very complementary to each other because somebody might actually want to own an e-bike um, and use that for their day to day, but then they might be traveling or they might be taking an Uber and out with friends somewhere, and then maybe they take a, an e-scooter one to two miles on the rental side. Uh, and if you can use the same app for both, you start to get 
you know, the, the ecosystem going, which becomes very, very powerful. But for us, we want to be there for uh, as many customers as possible, whether they want to rent or own. Uh, what's important to us is, is trying to get them out of the gas car. Absolutely. And so, you know, the job to be done is, um, is, is providing optionality, is providing power and freedom. Um, and, you know, the delivery of it could be through one mode, multiple modes, multiple trips, trip chains, all these things. Um, and, you know, like, I, I always love these old stories, like, you know, back in the 1950s, uh, people looked at technology up until that moment, right? Consumer technologies, you, you, you know, you saw the rise of appliances, you, you saw the, the labor saving of washing machines and, and, and you know, uh, more and more electric motors were being adopted by households. And if people were to extrapolate from the 1950s and you see these movies about how the future will be, they, they, they picture that, you know, a housewife would push a button and, you know, meals would come out of a machine already manufactured, so to speak, like, you know, pre-cooked so that she wouldn't have to even do the assembly of the food. But in reality, it's not like we ended up with these machines that cook in our homes or, or prepare, assemble meals in our homes. We ended up with delivery. We ended up with takeout. We ended up with, with the, you know, outsourcing meals, which is a completely different. And, and micro, by the way, is playing its role there as well because it's it's helping to deliver meals. But what what's fascinating is just like the enablement of communications, of computation, of of uh, distribution. All of these enabled new things to emerge, which didn't follow the trajectory. We did end up pushing a button to get a meal, but it happened to be a button on a phone, not a button on your stove. That's an interesting question, right? As you look forward and ask, how are we going to see what the things that transportation is hired to do today? We think it's about moving people or goods, but it might be actually bringing things to people. It might be actually, you know, creating community. It might be actually all these other things that we really crave more than we just want to get, you know, our butts moved. So, um, so in, in that sense, I encourage everyone to think about how to, you know, enable this both through services and software and, and devices, but it's like, it's, you've got to have a holistic view. And, um, and again, I'm not, not, this is more preaching than, than asking a question, but, um, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts if you, if you guys are, are thinking about this, because I know you've experimented with payments and other things. Are you looking more than just transportation? Are you looking for an ecosystem, a platform of some kind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you're saying all makes sense. I mean, it, it is interesting when you think about trying to, you know, replace as many gas trips as possible. You start to look at, you know, kind of food delivery. You start to look at, you know, what's going on with with Amazon delivery and, and other delivery. It's it's all super interesting. I mean, I think the industry, you know, the entire micro mobility industry will continue to to go after that. I know there's there's players already going after all of those things. Um, and I think you'll continue to to see that trend. So that's that's super interesting for us. We're trying to stay, you know, laser focused on uh, on that mission of trying to make cities more livable by by reducing those those gas car trips. And so you'll continue to see us focused focus there, you know, initially with the e-scooter and e-bike. But, you know, we we also need to continue to do more just on the transportation side to to make it you know more accessible to, you know, more people for for various different types of trips. I mean, it's the whole unbundling of of the car, um, as I know you've talked about a lot in the in the past, and and we certainly uh, agree with that. So we want to continue to to look at all those things. But anytime you know there's a, a gas car involved uh, or a gas truck involved, we think it's interesting to at least look at: is there a a business that makes sense for us? Totally. Um, are you investing also in looking at discovery? And uh, you know, in some ways, what I say is like you know the 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 map is you know, is the browser of micromobility, right? So you might remember the browser wars. And so the ability to discover um, new, conf you know, configurations of transport um, and, and, and provide these options to, to users. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm not sure, and I don't want to get religious about things like we, we got with the browsers, it's like we're going to have platform wars and we're going to have camps forming. But the idea of kind of, Maps seems very important to me and um, as a way for people to make decisions about travel. So to the extent that that Google Maps, for example, will surface a ride hail or Google Maps will surface a micro 
trip, um, that should drive adoption. And uh, is that something, am I, am I crazy to think about the, you know, the maps as kind of the really the front end of the whole thing? Uh, well, I don't think it's crazy to think about it that way. And I think there's some some good points in there. The way I think about it, at least, is the map is really important for any service that comes to you. So in other words, like if you want a rideshare vehicle that's coming to you, you, you want to open up the map. If you want food delivery, you know, you'll sometimes open the map or I guess menu uh, to do it. You know, the interesting thing about micromobility is most people tend to see the vehicle first and then open the app. And so in that context, the map becomes a little bit diluted and less important. Um, but I, I think, you know, there's definitely something something to that. And, and I think the, the map is in, important. I think it just depends on, you know, the service you're talking about. And is the service coming to you or are you are you on your way to a one mile or two mile trip and you happen to see a vehicle and then you open your map? Interesting, because you say, you know, people see the vehicle and then they make a decision. And, and that's that's a, that's another thing about micro that's unique, that it sort of acts as its own advertising. And, and the customer acquisition costs are there for, you know, basically the vehicle uh, fleet. And um, yeah, there's it's non-zero, but it's it's a it's a different economics. Right. So uh, it, how do you think about that in terms of like optimization, fleet size and so on? Are you. Um, are you looking at uh, also maybe changing the way you uh, you create demand? Are, are you thinking about advertising differently or are you thinking about customer acquisition? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, so we yeah, we think about we, we think about that deeply because, you know, in the ride sharing days, you know, there was massive price wars. And I don't think you see the same level of price wars in micromobility because of this phenomenon of the vehicles don't go to you. And so you don't kind of sit on the couch and look at the map and, and, and price shop as much. And so, um, you know, I think it's been good for the industry as a whole that that you don't need to open the, you know, the map generally. Um, but but I think um, I think, you know, as you mentioned, there's, you know, when I'm thinking about, you know, startups generally, you know, in my pre previous lives and even even now as we're thinking about new things, I mean, one of the first questions is always, you know, how are you going to get distribution? Um, and, you know, you're obviously that's the most important thing because you could have a magical, you know, service, but if nobody ever sees it or uses it, yeah. then it's, then it doesn't really have an impact on the world. And so distribution ultimately becomes, you know, very important. And so whether that's, you already have a map or, you know, in the case of micromobility, the vehicles are out on the road and they're kind of, you know, creating their own demand for you. Um, you tend to need some sort of a unique distribution channel to, to make these things work. So another thing about the sort of the evolution here, because we talked about, form factor evolution. We talked about uh, kind, of, kind of distribution questions and, and uh, uh, business model, but, but a lot of people, when you first, at, when you bring up this question, I see this all the time every day. Um, they'll say, oh, you know, where I live, it, you know, there's no infrastructure, there's no, the weather's lousy or there's hills or, or for whatever physical reason. Um, just gen generally the, you know, and I think this is typical of people who are not gonna be early, early adopters, or this is typical of the, sort of like the, the the late majority maybe or the laggards and you shouldn't bother with those customers initially because you know you're like you said four years old you're going to get to them you know in 15 years but but still you know i, I as a kind of an analyst i like to think about what is the project projected trajectory um and a lot of the things dealing with weather and roads and conditions um and I believe fundamentally the way the car went, right? The car was initially, you know, three wheels. Uh, it was an open, open vehicle. Uh, it was hard to use. It was hard to start. You, you know, you had to be a mechanic to keep it running and all that other stuff that had, came with the technology or beyond. And it just got solved over time. It just got better and better. And I think the micro, you know, whatever deficiencies it may have, it's got a huge amount of headroom. I don't see it as, you know, obstacles. I see it as opportunity. So. How do we think about uh, kind of the evolution and, and it goes hand in hand with infrastructure, obviously, the more uh, and the, the car did as well, the more the roads got better, the cars got better. And and so um, are you guys, do you know, do you guys have R&D? Like, are you looking actively at innovating on the vehicle side? Are you are you looking at maybe even having concepts that that are uh, out there and 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 far forward? I know you're focused. I, I hear that. But. It's so like how much ambition now do you have on the on the on kind of really going after the the longer trips? Yeah, I mean, we we certainly uh, do have ambitions to continue to 
you know, come up with, as I mentioned, new form factors really to go after as, as many short distance trips as possible. Um, what you what you won't see us do is build an electric, you know, car or something like that. I mean, uh, I think that's already like hyper competitive space. And frankly, you know, our roads today just can't keep up with the amount of traffic that cars are creating. So to me, it seems like, you know, micro EVs uh, and, and in particular things that can go in the bike lane um, are, are the most interesting. But I, I do think there's going to continue to be innovations on the form factor. Um, as well, and Bird will certainly be, you know, trying to do our part there. We're, you know, we are investing. It is one of the nice things about being a public company is easier access to capital and and allows us to do, you know, maybe even more R&D than, than we could in the past. Um, but, I, you know, I think there'll be all sorts of interesting things there from us and, and I'm sure others on, on this call. Um, but, you know, on the infrastructure side, I, I do think, you know, trying to figure out ways to work with cities you know, to get more dedicated parking infrastructure and more bike lanes. I mean, it kind of surprises me a lot that there's not one dedicated micro EV parking space on every downtown city core block. Um, Cause you just take one parking space away from a car and we've put images out trying to show this, but you know, just having the green bike lane, you know, kind of merge into a green parking space kind of seems obvious to me, and I'm, some cities are, are, are very receptive and are starting to think about that, but I think the more we can make the bike lanes actually merge into one dedicated parking space for, for micromobility, I think um, it solves a lot of the infrastructure problems. And so I think it's a combination of more R&D investment on different form factors, plus cities continuing to roll out more infrastructure. I just wanted to thank you both. Um, it was a super interesting conversation. And honestly, if, if there's a Mount Rushmore for micromobility, I think both of you have a spot on it. And um, so, so we're super, super happy to have you and, and very lucky. Um, so uh, thanks again for being here. Uh, just in case anyone here missed it, um, we did announce that we'll be having Micromobility Europe in Amsterdam um, from June 1st to the 2nd. Um, the tickets are, are, are selling quite fast. So, so do follow um, the link that I'm gonna drop in the, in the chat. Um, and, and yeah, we have a, a whole slate of other conversations uh, starting very soon with uh, GoGrow, um, the co-founder and CEO of GoGrow, who will talk about battery as a service and, and building out a global uh, um, network of, of charging infrastructure. And then also um, some folks from eBike Labs who will kind of talk about how AI is, is becoming a really important tool in building out uh, safe and reliable um, e-bike products. So again, please join us for those. And, and thanks again, Travis and Horace, uh, for, for an amazing conversation. And uh, hope to see you guys soon, maybe in, in Amsterdam. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care. Right. Thanks both. Bye.